some of you, but I don't remember your name, so I just act like I've never met you before, amen. Uh, but we have uh, already had such a great time. It's so good to see so many friends. I recognize many of you from youth camp or years even beyond that. I mean, I knew the pastor's wife when she was just a young teenager, maybe even younger than that. I don't know. It's been a long time, and, and uh, we're still praying for her and that she'll get her heart right. Amen. We worked on her for a long time. Amen. No. But uh, Brother Nate is such a good friend of mine, and I think, I think it's been several months. My dad was up here. Uh, to preach, and uh, so, uh, man, I appreciate the invite. It's always a blessing to be here and uh, to be a part of what is going on here. I've got some folks with me. Uh, I've got my wife, Katie, is with me, and I've got some of my staff with me. It uh, makes me feel important, like I have an entourage, you know, when I've got people with me, but I have my personal assistant here, uh, Courtney Owen, her husband, Chris, and then I've got my youth leaders, uh, Brother Andrew and Miss Josie Smith. They are here with me, and we're going to have a good time and then head back tomorrow. Uh, but, man, we wanted to do something a little uh, different tonight, kind of fun. We're going to do some uh, Bible study, which is always good for a Sunday night. Amen. But you guys have got it right when you're talking about taking up an offering, and you got these cute little kids. And you know what I love about it is, man, they're looking at you right in the eye. You know what I mean? They're like, hey, you got something to get. And then when you don't give it the first, they're going to come back through. And then when they think that you haven't been cleaned out yet, they're going to come back through again. I really like that idea. I, Brother Chris leaned over to me and says, man, that, that can happen up here in the mountains. But where we're out at South Atlanta, I, I don't think there's one kid, including my own kids, that I would trust with any sort of collection for anything. I don't think we'd get it. We, we'd lose money, uh, you know, with our guys. But... Uh, Anyway, y'all have it right. I tell you what a blessing it is to be here. What a blessing it is to be able to answer some questions from God's Word. The Bible says that we have all that we need that pertaineth unto life and godliness, 2 Peter chapter 1, from God's Word. I don't believe there's any question that we could ask that God doesn't have an answer for us. And I think one of them is going to be found today that I hope would just be an encouragement to you, a blessing to you. We're going to allow Scripture to define Scripture, which I know that you are used to up here. Brother Nate has been such a dear friend of mine, and we, we, uh, we hang out with a, a crew of preachers that believe the Bible. And um, we're not always right, amen, but we, we do a good job of trying, and, uh, but we trust the book above all else. So I want you to take your Bible. We're going to use our Bibles tonight. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 2. I want you to go to Numbers chapter 6. That's where we're going to start. And then we're going to be kind of all over the place to allow us to find some answers today. We're going to talk about, you ready for this topic? Trees in the Garden of Eden. And what that has to do with us. Is that pretty fair? <laughs> all right. Trees in the Garden of Eden. And what in the world does that have to do with us? I know that you have seen those paintings, you know, of Adam and Eve, you know, in the Garden of Eden. I always thought, man, it's, it's so perfect that when that picture was taken, they went right behind the, the leaves at the right time to cover up what they needed to cover. It was amazing how they did that every time. But, but you know what? When they're going to grab the fruit, typically, what do you see that, that Eve grabs? is an apple, don't you? The apple. Well... I believe the scripture tells us exactly what the fruit is that she took. And I don't think it's an apple. Matter of fact, we're going to find from the word of God that it was a grape. Well, how do we do that? Well, let's, let's, let's look at some things today. By the way, if your pastor says anything different than what I'm saying tonight, he's right and I'm wrong. I'm going to go back to South Atlanta, right? And, and he'll correct anything that, I've, that I say here tonight. All right, let's look at it. Genesis chapter 2. Let's start there, and then we're going to be over Numbers chapter 6. Genesis chapter 2. Why in the world would I say that it's a grape? Well, and the Lord God, verse 16. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So there is one forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Does everybody agree with that so far? All right. This fruit, whatever it is, is forbidden. Well, there's only one fruit in the Bible that's forbidden 
anywhere else in the Bible. And it's over here in Numbers chapter 6. Let's look at it. Numbers chapter 6. Look at verse number 3. Number 6, verse number 3. He shall separate, talking about the Nazarite, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine no, nor vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made from the, what's the last two words? Vine tree. I remember the first time I talked to somebody and said, now listen to me, I believe that the, the forbidden fruit is the grape. What do they say? Well, that's not a tree. That's technically a vine. Well, that's fine. But the Bible says that it's called a vine tree. Everybody with me so far? Notice the vine is a tree, and the vine tree is the forbidden fruit for the Nazarite. Why is the vine tree for a Nazarite forbidden? Well, what we're going to find is, obviously, the vine tree is forbidden fruit because it is a type, and it is a type of blood. That's important. It's a type of blood. How do we know? Well, that's what Jesus said. Let's look over in Matthew chapter 26. And then we'll also be in Deuteronomy. All right, Matthew, Deuteronomy, all right. Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 26. You see, preacher, how is this going to help me? You'll see at the end. Just stay with me. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and said, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament. Well, what was it that he was drinking? The Bible tells us it is what? The fruit of the vine. So... We know then, he's saying that this fruit of the vine represents my blood. Everybody got it so far? How do we know? Well, look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I was wondering where I was getting some wind. There's a little fan down here. That's really nice. It's the details that are just so helpful. All right, Deuteronomy 32, <laughs> verse number 14. I don't know, just things you think of. Butter of kine and milk of sheep. Now, I know we normally skip over verses like this, but let's keep reading. With fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats, with the fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. Now, isn't that interesting? So let's start putting all this together so far, what we've learned in our Bible study tonight. There's one tree that's forbidden, and the pure blood of the grape, grape juice, is forbidden to the Nazarite. Because not only was it strong drink, right? Fermented grape juice, <laughs> but just anything, moist grapes, nothing that is made of the vine tree, nothing he can drink. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that grape juice is a type of blood. So then, should we then find that drinking blood in the Bible is also forbidden? You better believe it is. Not only is it forbidden before the law, it's forbidden during the law, and it's forbidden after the law. Genesis chapter 9, it says in verse number 4, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, ye shall not eat. It's forbidden in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 15, verse number 28. Acts chapter 15 and verse number 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood. So in Genesis chapter 9, before the law of Moses, we have blood, drinking blood is forbidden. During the law in Leviticus chapter 17, you can read all that later, Blood is forbidden. And then in our dispensation, the dispensation of the grace of God, in Acts chapter 15, 
There's one drink that's forbidden. You see, you see the pattern throughout all Scripture. So there are two items in the Bible that are forbidden to put in your mouth. One of them is blood, forbidden before the law, under the law, after the law. That blood, Deuteronomy says, is typified as the pure blood of the grape. Okay? All that's together. So therefore, grape juice then is forbidden for the Nazarite. Grape juice comes from the grape. And the grape is said to come from a vine tree. That's what we've got so far. Everybody with me so far? All right. Now, did you also notice that the first two miracles in the Bible that are done, in the, old, the first one in the Old Testament, the first one in the New Testament, are both converting something into blood or into grape juice. John chapter 2 and Exodus chapter 4. Let's look at it. The first will say man-made miracle in the Old Testament where God used a man. That Moses does in going down to the land of Egypt coincides with the first miracle that Jesus does to begin his public ministry. John chapter 2. Exodus 4, John chapter 2. Now, in John chapter 2 and verse number 9, both cases you're, you're dealing with the transformation of something into blood or the, the pure blood of the grape, grape juice. John chapter 2 and verse number 9. When the ruler of the feast had the water that was made wine. So notice, water is made wine. Now, I don't have time for this, but I know that you know that there are two types of wine that are defined in the Bible. You have new wine and old wine. New wine is defined in the Bible as coming straight from the pure blood of the grape, what you and I would call grape juice. Old wine would be fermented wine or strong drink. Everybody with me? Okay. So notice that if something Jesus was going to make when the ruler of the feast had the water that was made wine, it was immediate, so it was new. Water turned into grape juice. Verse 11 of John chapter 2 says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. So the first miracle, that he, a lot of people say, well, what did he do from about 12 years old to 30? That was miraculous. I mean, can you imagine what kind of football player Jesus was? I mean, he could throw from one sideline to the other. I mean, it's amazing. From one end zone to the other. He could kick a field goal. No, he didn't do any miracles until he started his public ministry there at 30 years old. Everybody with me? That's what it says. The beginning of miracles. That means when he started doing miracles. Because that's what beginning means. See, I'm a doctor. It, that's, that's what you need to have in order to understand that. The beginning of miracles. That was a joke. Now in Exodus chapter 4, in the Old Testament, the first two signs that Moses has done are done to Pharaoh. Nothing happens. But the first sign that affects the land of Egypt is something different. In Exodus chapter 4, look at verse number 8. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass that they do not believe also these two signs, neither hearken to thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. The Lord is teaching us something here. So the first miracle in the Old Testament is turning water into blood. The first miracle in the New Testament is turning water into the pure blood of of the grape. Everybody with me? Remember, Adam and Eve took of what we believe to be the vine tree and something happened to them. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we're about to put all this together. In the Old Testament, before the law, during the law, after the law, blood is forbidden. In the Old Testament, grape juice from a vine tree is forbidden from a Nazarite. In the New Testament, grape juice is clearly a type of blood. Jesus said that it was. When Christ shows up, the first thing he does to demonstrate his power is to turn water into new wine, to grape juice. And then he says at the Lord's Supper that this fruit of the vine pictures my blood. So notice the connection between new wine, the pure blood of the grape, and blood. 
All right. Notice this. Go back over to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse number 9. Notice that life here first comes from water. The Lord said, let the waters bring forth, as you know. Under the heaven be, of course, gathered together. We understand that. Uh, look at verse number 20. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath, what? Life. And fowl that may fly above the heaven in the open firmament of the heavens. So the first thing that Moses does is take that water and turn that water into blood. In Genesis chapter 1, when water, uh, when God creates life, he creates it first from water. So you got water, grape juice, blood. Those three things right there are connected inseparably in the Word of God. Those three things right in there. There's no way you can get those things apart. Water is going into grape juice. Water is going to blood. Blood and grape juice are connected. Yes? That's what we've seen so far. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Let's see what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 23. Now remember, the fall, they did not take of the fruit until when? Genesis chapter 3. But here in Genesis chapter 2, we find something very interesting. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood. Is that what she says? Is that what he says? No. You find bones and you find flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So Adam says, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Doesn't say anything about blood, right? There's no blood there. What you find that before Adam fell there in Genesis chapter 3, with the whole of Scripture together, life comes from water. Notice first miracle, water to blood. First miracle, New Testament, water to the pure blood of the grape. Adam was born, was created, I should say, bone and flesh, no blood. What do we mean? Well, let's go to another verse. Go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Now, in Luke chapter 24, Jesus is appearing now in His resurrected, glorified body. And in Luke chapter 24, in verse number 39, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and what? Bones. As ye see me have. See, Jesus is making something very clear. Now he's in his resurrected body. He has flesh and bones. Before Adam ever fell into sin by taking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he was flesh and bones. The resurrected body has no blood. Neither did Adam. How do we know that? Well, if Jesus shed his blood on the cross... Why would then his resurrected body have blood? Matter of fact, the Bible tells us, watch this. Look over in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 9, I assume this is mine. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own, what? Blood. He entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, this isn't part of what I want to talk about here tonight, but I, I, I think it's worth mentioning. That Do you remember that when Mary Magdalene saw the Lord Jesus Christ right outside of the tomb, he tells her, touch me not. You remember the reason why he said, touch me not? For I am not yet ascended to my Father. But then here, what I just read in Luke chapter 24, we find something interesting. He tells the disciples, 
touch me, handle me. Why? You know what I believe happened from his appearance to Mary Magdalene? To his appearance here to his disciples? He had the opportunity in his resurrected body to go to the third heaven and offer his blood, as Hebrews chapter 9 says, and then he comes back, flesh and bones, no blood. Amazing. Because see, not only was Jesus the great high priest, he was also the lamb slain. So he was both the sacrifice and the high priest who offered the sacrifice. Only God can do something like that. Wow. All right. Let's go somewhere else. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is describing the resurrection, isn't he? And he's describing the resurrected body. Something very interesting about this resurrected body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 50. If you're there, say amen. That's what I tell my church. Except I only get like one amen. Because we have the verses on the screen, you know. Oh, you do too. <laughs> All right. Well, then I can go even faster now. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and what? Blood. What's next? Cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I know that in this church, your pastor has, I'm sure, given you the great difference between the kingdom of heaven, that earthly, physical, fleshly kingdom versus the kingdom of God, spiritual. So he says here, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That means your blood is not going to get in in your resurrected body. You'll have glorified flesh and blood. Bones, because the Bible says our body is going to be like Christ. Christ made it clear he has flesh and bones. He offered his blood already. There's no blood in the resurrected body. What's the context? Look at verse 45 of 1 Corinthians 15. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So when Adam was created from the dust of the ground, he had flesh and bones, but no blood. Christ, when he arose from the dead, had flesh and bones, but no blood. When Christ comes back and catches away the church, and we are transformed in the moment of the twinkling of an eye, we'll have flesh and bones, no blood. So then here's the natural question. How in the world did Adam and Eve get blood? And where did Adam get his blood from? Well... Remember what fruit they took. The vine tree that's called the pure blood of the grape. Why then would the vine tree be described as the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Watch this. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse number 34. How many are having fun tonight? Anybody? All right. Matthew chapter, I'm having a blast. I don't know about y'all, but Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 34. Now, let me ask you this. What, this is not a trick question. What organ pumps your blood? Excellent. Somebody said brain. I'm going to walk out that door right there, get my car and go home right there. Heart. Sure. Well, now look at this connection between good and evil in the heart. Look at Matthew 12, verse number 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. The knowledge of good and evil. Notice the connection to the heart. Your blood pumping muscle. Hmm. You know what I believe happened? Obviously, we know. Well, I, I'll get ahead of myself here. Obviously, you know that, that not just any vine tree. We're talking about a vine tree in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God. We understand the taking of that fruit. I believe is very clear that Adam and Eve, before they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, didn't have blood. You know what I believe ran through their circulatory system? Well, what gets turned into blood in Exodus chapter 4 and what gets turned into blood in John chapter 
too. Water. Water. Have you ever wondered, even today, when a person is said to be of royal blood, they're called what? Blue bloods. You ever heard that? Huh. I believe their circulatory system had water. That would be Adam's original condition. All right, so the tree. Let's go back to the tree. That's not the only tree that's mentioned in the garden. There are a few. Let's get back to it. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 2. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 2. We're going to highlight at least four of them. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. I believe we've defined what at least one of them was. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I believe it was a vine tree. I believe we know another one. Look on down to verse number 7 of Genesis chapter 3. After the fall, it says this. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Well, there, there's a fig tree in that garden. So now we know there's a vine tree. There's a fig tree. Let's see if we can find another tree. Look at uh, chapter 2 and verse number 9. Out of the ground... May the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of what? Life. He is also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right. So, so far, what do we know? We know in the Garden of Eden, there's a tree of life. There's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there's a fig tree. I believe Ezekiel tells us about some other trees, but we did a cedar tree and there's a chestnut tree. I don't have time for any of that tonight. Let's focus on these. We have the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and a fig tree. At least three. One of them's a fig. We don't yet know what the other ones are. All right, look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 18. I know, me too. Genesis chapter 3, look at verse number 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So now we have thorns and thistles. So already in Genesis 3, I know four things. There are thorns and thistles, a fig tree, a tree of life, and a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Everybody with me so far? All right. We've already learned what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's see if we can find the other ones, what they're they're called. Let's go to Judges. Judges chapter 9. I know, the book of Judges, a book that nobody really likes to read or study. But Scripture with Scripture, here's some trees that show up right in the middle of the book of Judges. By the way, the best commentary on Scripture. Somebody said, what kind of commentary? The best commentary on the Word of God is the Word of God. It's your own internal commentary. It's your own internal dictionary. It's amazing. Judges chapter 9, verse number 8, our English Bible is always superior to any, by the way, fundamental scholarship's opinion about what the Bible actually says. Judges chapter 9 and verse number 8. So here's a dream, a vision. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, Huh, come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said to them, Should I leave my wine which cheereth God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? And then look at verse 14. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. Now wouldn't you know it, 
right here in the book of Judges, just like in the garden, you got four trees. Notice in Judges, you have an olive tree, a vine tree, a fig tree, and a bramble. In Genesis, there's the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thorns and thistles, and a fig tree. They're going to have to match. Those of you who know your Bible in Romans chapter 9, all the way to, to chapter 11, know that the olive tree is a picture of God giving life to the nation of Israel. And what is olive, what is oil, olive oil, a picture of in the Bible? The life-giving Spirit of God. Remember the anointing of the Holy Spirit that we find in the New Testament? That same term anointing or anointed is in reference to the olive oil there in, in, in the Scriptures. And so notice then, in Romans chapter 11, look at verse number 24. Romans chapter 11, verse number 24. Olive oil, clearly a picture of the Holy Spirit. Therefore... I believe that the tree of life is defined for us through Judges chapter 9 as the olive tree. Romans chapter 11 and verse number 24. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye would be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So you got the olive tree that brings forth life. Well, the, the, the tree of life, the Spirit of God, is pictured as olive oil. You find that that's the only life-giving source that you and I have. Then you've got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the vine tree. Then you have the bramble, the thorns and the thistles. And then notice you have the fig tree. The fig tree is interesting because the fig tree is cursed by the Lord. Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 19. Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 19. And the tree, that it's a fig tree, it's cursed. Isn't it interesting that in the scripture that Adam and Eve tried to cover up their sin with the figs, the fig aprons that they made. That wasn't good enough because the Bible says that God clothed Adam and Eve with what? Coats of skins. And already there in the book of Genesis, the principle was taught that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Adam and Eve thought that they could cover up their sin with their own works. So the fig tree is a great picture of self-righteousness. What do you find? You find a tree but no fruit. Over there in Matthew chapter 21 verse number 19. And when he saw a fig tree in the way. He came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it. Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered, the, withered away. So we find then the fig tree Cursed, we find the tree of life, the life-giving source, the picture of life-giving is the olive oil, the anointing, the Holy Spirit of God. All of that goes together. The tree of life is an olive tree. The vine tree has to be the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it's forbidden for us. Now, I, I mean, I just took you the hard route right there. We just, it took us a long time to get there. Now, there's an even easier way than that. All right? I want you to remember this. The Lord told Adam, be fruitful and multiply. He told Noah, be fruitful and multiply. He told Adam, replenish the earth. He told Noah, replenish the earth. Don't get me started on why he had to tell Adam to replenish the earth. That's a whole other topic. Adam had Seth, Cain, and Abel that are named for us. Noah had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. One of Noah's boys was under a curse, Ham. One of Adam's boys was under a curse, Cain. One of Adam's boys is a type of Christ, Abel. One of Noah's boys is a type of Christ, Shem. Do you see that? Adam is naked. Noah is naked. Isn't that what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 20? And Noah began to be a husbandman. And wouldn't you know it? He planted a vineyard. 
And he drank of the wine and was drunken. If all of those other things lined up, what did Adam take? What did he take of? The vine tree. That's what Adam did. So what they took was a grape. Now, I'm not saying that those grapes will make you drunk. I'm not saying in the original sin, because obviously it's a supernatural tree with supernatural properties, but it is a vine tree. And from henceforth forever, it's an amazing thing how drunkenness and nakedness throughout all the Scripture go hand in hand. Habakkuk 2.15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. They go together. Now, and that's something. So you find that Adam and Eve, they, they sewed fig leaves together. When Noah's naked, what did his sons do? They covered him. Do you remember? That same principle. See, it always comes right together. Right? That's how that goes. King James Bible always sets the pace. It's also interesting to note, and I'm not saying this is the end all, but have you ever seen a vine tree? You know what it looks like? It looks like a slithering snake. You ever notice that? That's how it goes. I think that's more than just an accident. I think it's intentional. Deuteronomy, look at it, 32. Look at verse number 32. Deuteronomy 32, verse number 32. We're almost done. Deuteronomy 32, verse 32. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of ass. Let me just throw this out there for fun. Again, this is not part of of the study here. You know, we always talk about what took place at the Lord's Supper there. And allowing Scripture to define Scripture, we, of course, know of the dream of Joseph. Joseph is such a strong type of Christ, one of the clearest types of Christ in the Old Testament. And we talk about, of course, that there are two elements that were taken there at the Lord's Supper. One, of course, was the breaking of bread. Remember, he took the bread, and what did he do? He broke it, didn't he? And it was a picture of his broken body. Well, remember what he said, that the juice, the drink that they took, what was it a picture of? His shed blood, right? Do you remember that when the wrath of God is poured out upon the earth during the tribulation period, he pictures it, right, as the the press, the wine press being trodden under. In other words, you know, you've seen those people where they do their stepping on the grapes, right, and crushing those grapes out to get the juice. Well, over there in the book of Genesis, we find the dream. Do you remember of the butler and the baker? Do you remember what he talked about when he was the cupbearer to Pharaoh? What did he do? He took the cup. He took the cluster of grapes, and what did he do? He squeezed it out. Do you remember what Jesus said? He talks about his body being broken. You know what I believe he was saying here when he says, I will not take him for or this fruit of the vine. I think he is showing him the cluster, and he is squeezing out the grapes, just like in the book of Genesis, into the cup. Amazing. It all goes together. So, Olive tree, the vine tree, the fig tree, and the bramble, the thorns and the thistles that we find in the Garden of Eden where the original curse of mankind took place. You say, Pastor, what in the world does this have to do with me? What do I care what kind of trees were in the Garden of Eden? I want you to see something amazing. You have four trees. The olive tree the vine tree, the fig tree, and the thorns and thistles. All of them in the Garden of Eden. Do you realize then that the olive tree, the vine tree, the fig tree, and the bramble all show up at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ when He died to become a curse for us that took place first in the Garden of Eden? Four trees show up. Let's look at them. The olive tree. Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 30. Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 30. And when they had sung an hymn, 
they went out into the Mount of Olives. There's your olive tree. How about the vine tree? Look at verse number 29 of the same chapter. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this, I believe he's holding it in his hand here, of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The Mount of Olives, the olive tree, the fruit of the vine, the pure blood from the cluster, right there. How about the fig tree? Mark chapter 11, verse 20. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dry up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. Shortly thereafter, he would be crucified. You have the olive tree. You have the vine tree. You have the fig tree. All we need is the thorns. Huh. Do you remember thorns showing up at the crucifixion of Christ? Would you look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 29. Matthew chapter 27 verse 29. And when they had platted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Why, of all that could show up here, why do these four trees show up at the events surrounding the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know why? Go over to Galatians chapter 3. (laughs) This is so good. Galatians chapter 3, look at verse number 13. And then we'll be in Colossians as well. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. Why of all the different ways that Christ could have been sacrificed for us, notice which way He died. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Hmm. How about Colossians chapter 2? Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 13. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 13, it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the circumcision of your uncircumcision of your flesh... Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. You see how it all goes together. You see, we were condemned in sin and for eternity unless we had the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all of those things that represented man's rebellion against God, he had life with the tree of life. He certainly see that God had given him life through his spirit. He breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul. And in the day that he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Bible says in that day, Ye shall surely die. He died spiritually at that moment. And he began to slowly die physically. Then, of course, you see the result. And they covered, tried to cover themselves with, with, with the, the, uh, the, the, the works of the flesh. With the aprons that they made of figs. And then, of course, you see the thorns and the thistles now representing the curse of man. The curse of the earth because of sin. And Jesus took every bit of that away when he was crucified on a tree. Isn't that wonderful? All of those things go together. And let me finish with this. There just happened to be, shocker, four things typified as a tree of life in Scripture. Something that should nourish us, sustain us, and give us everlasting life. Notice, wisdom is a tree of life. 
Wisdom is a tree of life. Proverbs 3.18 says, She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. Job 28.28, And unto the man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And apart from evil is understanding. Wisdom is a tree of life. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. The Bible says in Proverbs 11.30, The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. See where I got that? And he that winneth souls is wise. Hope. Realize is a tree of life. Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. And then a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Proverbs 15, 4, I swear I got this, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Man, I wish we had a Bible we could understand better. But perverseness therein is a breach in the Spirit. 1 Timothy 6, 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So, what's the point? Every answer we could ever, any question we could ever ask, and the answer is found in God's Word. Something that seems quite insignificant as to what type of trees. When we see that picture throughout all of Scripture, what a great witness that it is to the sacrifice and the significance of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for you and me. Isn't it wonderful today that we serve a Savior who has delivered us. He became sin for us who knew no sin. He took what Adam and Eve did, right? And he shed his blood so that we might have everlasting life. Thank you for listening to that. Isn't it fun just to allow scripture to find scripture? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the liberty to be able to teach and preach. Lord, thank you for the relationships here that we have. Lord, I just pray that you'll help us.